What is socialism? This question is being asked by millions of people around the world. At the suggestion of various political figures, certain individuals and groups are declared socialists. There are many political movements that call themselves socialist or aim to fight for socialism. Finally, there are countries that position themselves as socialist states. In this video, we will take a brief look at the history of socialism, its definition, and if it is possible today. Throughout the history of human society, violence and exploitation have provoked protest from both the oppressed and the educated representatives of the ruling classes. This protest was expressed in fantastic images of a society in which inequality, oppression, exploitation, and private property were absent. These ideas were called utopian socialism. Utopian projects can be found throughout the development of capitalism, starting from the 16th century. The most prominent and influential representatives of this trend were the Frenchman Henry Saint-Simon, Charles Fourier, and the Englishman Robert Owen, who lived in the early 19th century. They condemned capitalism as an unjust system and eloquently described the disasters of millions of people. Utopians convinced their followers of the need to replace capitalism with a more progressive organization of social life. However, they believed that in order to bring their plans to life, it was enough to show people the advantages of the system they imagined and the disadvantages of the existing one. These thinkers could not point out the causes of the injustices generated by capitalism. Scientific ways to rebuild society and find the power that could do it. The transformation of socialism from utopia into science became possible thanks to the persistent long-term work done by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Marx and Engels started to study world history and a critical revision of previous theories and came to important conclusions. Firstly, a classless, just society, as socialism was seen to be, is not just an alternative to modern capitalism, but the next stage in the development of society, the prerequisites for which are created by capitalism itself. Secondly, socialism can, should, and will be based not so much on ethical principles as on the advanced material and technical base and the latest achievements of science. It will be based on large-scale industry and machine production, concentration of production, and a single plan. Thirdly, the role of the gravedigger of capitalism must be assumed by the working class as the most revolutionary class generated by capitalism itself. Fourth, the state should play an important role in the transition to a classless society. First, the conquest of political power by the working class is necessary, through which all further changes are carried out. It is impossible to do without taking power and using the state, since the deposed capitalists will certainly want to return the old order. Marxism presents socialism as the first phase of communist society. Marx wrote, What we have to deal with here is a communist society not as it developed on its own foundations, but, on the contrary, just as it emerges from capitalist society, which is thus, in every respect, economically, morally, and intellectually, still stamped with the birthmarks of the old society from whose womb it emerges. But these defects are inevitable in the first phase of communist society, as it is when it has just emerged after prolonged birth pangs from capitalist society. The utopian socialists wanted to change society by peacefully convincing the capitalists that their system was ruinous for humanity. Scientific socialism resolves the contradictions of the capitalist system through the proletarian revolution. During this period, the working class, organized and led by the communist party, overthrew the exploiting classes and took the first steps towards communism, embarking on the construction of socialism Socialism, as the first or lowest stage of a new classless society, is characterized by public ownership of the means of production, including in the form of state property, centralized planned economy, distribution of goods according to the principle, from each according to ability, to each according to work, and the presence of certain remnants of capitalism. Socialism also includes such things as the abolition of land ownership, 
the centralization of the banking system, communications, and transport in the hands of the working class, as well as free education. Thanks to a centrally planned economy based on the highest technology and rational allocation of resources, there are no longer endless economic crises, unemployment, homelessness, exploitation, and oppression. Of course, these problems are not solved simultaneously immediately after the socialist revolution. However, the socialist state, unlike modern capitalist states, puts the solution of these problems at the heart of its policy. The political basis of socialism is the dictatorship of the proletariat, the power of the working people, led by the working class, and its communist party. All politics in a socialist society is aimed at satisfying the interests of the working masses, and the ultimate goal of socialism is to build communism. Under socialism, workers receive material and immaterial values depending on the amount of work performed. The principle of from each according to abilities to each according to work is implemented. The other part of the value produced by workers is obtained indirectly through healthcare, housing, the development of science and technology, pensions, etc. Socialism still bears the birthmarks of the capitalist society from which it originated. Therefore, under socialism, the state, the armed forces, and prisons are preserved. However, now they are used not against the majority of society, but against a minority, that is, exploiters, and the capitalists of other countries who support them. Thus, socialism is the first phase of communism. The economic basis of socialism is social ownership of the means of production. The political basis is the power of the working masses under the leadership of the working class led by the Marxist-Leninist party. Socialism is a social system that excludes the exploitation of man by man and systematically develops in the interests of improving the welfare of the people and the comprehensive development of each member of society. The last century gives us examples of socialist countries. The October Revolution in Russia in 1917 allowed the world to begin the successful construction of socialism for the first time. For the first time in public history, Power passed to the majority of the population, the working class and the working peasantry. For the first time in public history, a state emerged without private ownership of the means of production. Soviet Russia and its allied republics were able to defend themselves during the First World War and the Civil War. Contrary to the false predictions of capitalists about the imminent collapse of communism, the Soviet Union proved its viability for decades. The Soviet experience is an example of the largest and most successful socialist construction in the world. In the USSR, the exploiting classes were deprived of power and suppressed in every possible way, and the state obeyed the interests of the working people, and was headed by the Revolutionary Communist Party. Labor collectives themselves determined and put their candidates up for election. They could recall a deputy at any time, and the line between the state apparatus and the ordinary citizen was erased as much as possible. Ordinary citizens influenced the policy of the state through local councils and mass organizations. The Soviet government provided unprecedented involvement of workers in the governance of the country. Only in the first three years of the revolution, hundreds of thousands of ordinary citizens were involved in state administration through the Congresses of Soviets. Such a figure is unthinkable for modern states even a century later. The broad masses of workers took an active part in the construction of socialism and the development of the national economy. Thus, in the first six months of 1926 to 1927, Soviet workers submitted 11,868 production proposals, 75% of which were accepted by the administration, and 7,000 were implemented during this period. Over time, the participation of workers in the management of production had grown greatly. By the mid-1930s, the socialist sector of the economy had displaced all others in the production of fixed assets, industrial products, agricultural products, and national income in a broader sense. Socialist construction in the USSR led to the construction of a single economic complex, which functioned according to a single plan, and the main means of production were in public ownership. Soviet society was deprived of private property, exploitation of man by man, and market anarchy. Thanks to the socialist economy of the USSR, unemployment, homelessness, and economic crises were completely defeated, and production growth rates were an unprecedented 9.7% from 1950 to 1974. 
while the growth in the United States was 4.4%. Citizens of the Soviet Union had rights that no state in the modern world can grant. Free healthcare, complete free education, free housing, social stability, the right to work, the absence of crises and price increases, and much more. National conflicts were overcome and major measures were implemented to achieve gender equality. In addition, the presence of such a powerful socialist state as the USSR on the planet forced capitalists in European countries in the United States to make concessions for decades. The bourgeoisie was forced to share a small part of its super profits and listen to the trade unions in order to prevent socialist revolutions in their countries. This is confirmed in practice by the reduction of social guarantees throughout the world for decades after the collapse of the world's system of socialism. It was the worker's state and socialism that turned the once agrarian state into an advanced power that withstood the greatest war in the history of mankind, restored the destroyed country, and created the world's system of socialism. All this suggests that it is quite possible to build socialism and that it is effective. Socialist construction in the past was not without problems and flaws, including a partial shortage of goods, political repression, and the counter-revolution itself. Opponents of socialism believe that these problems are caused by socialism itself and are caused by a planned economy. However, these problems are caused by the surrounding conditions and the specifics of that time. The lack of experience had an effect because everything had to be done from scratch. Colossal remnants of past regimes and the general backwardness of countries played their role. Let's look at one example. Political repression is often blamed on communists. The political repressions and purges of the 30s in the USSR were caused not by socialism itself, but by the threat of a new war against the Soviet Republic. Repression is only one of the tools of the working class's struggle for a better future. They were applied and can be applied only to the enemies of the working class the elements who oppose its power and want to restore the old order, the very order that exists today and poisons the lives of millions of workers. The repressions were a forced measure of the socialist state, undertaken in response to the threat of an attack from the capitalists, the fascist Third Reich with the support of other bourgeois states that hoped to incite Hitler against the USSR, the stronghold of workers and peasants all over the world hated by them. And in the future, the major capitalist powers did not cease to exert pressure on the Soviet Union, including intelligence services, the cultural sphere, and so on. Excesses in the repressive policy were caused by illiteracy and backwardness of personnel in the young Soviet Union. All of this does not mean that socialism means repression. Moreover, capitalists and their defenders like to talk about repression in socialist countries, but they're silent about the millions of people who died at their will as a result of hunger, social instability, and the wars they unleashed. The communists are also blamed for the shortage of goods. However, even here the problem is not socialism as such, but in the surrounding conditions and the specific situation. The lack of experience, as well as the illiterate policy of managers in some cases, an example of which is the Kasigian reform, the introduction and strengthening of elements of a market economy, all of these contributed to a shortage. There is nothing in socialism that would naturally lead to crises, a change of power, shortages, repression. However, under capitalism, crises, repression, lawlessness, corruption, mass unemployment, and homelessness regularly occur, and there is a partial shortage of some goods and services. The very existence of capitalism leads to millions of victims every year from hunger, diseases, war, poverty, substandard medicines, rising prices. According to Oxfam statistics, in 2019, 2,000 billionaires own more wealth than 4.5 billion of the world's population. All these phenomena under capitalism are natural and are caused precisely by the capitalist system. Today, ideologists of capitalism promote the idea that socialism means the expanding intervention of the bourgeois state in certain spheres of life for example, in the field of healthcare. However, this view contradicts reality since it portrays the state as an abstraction. Each state pursues a policy that generally meets the interests of the ruling class. Capitalists use various methods to pursue their interests. 
They promote their candidates for parliament and the government, thanks to which laws favorable to them are adopted. The implementation of these laws is monitored by officials, police officers, the army, and judges who are ready to use force against the workers. Finally, the actions of the state in foreign policy reflect the desire of the capitalists to preserve and, if possible, increase their profits. Minor reforms and interference in the economy on the behalf of the bourgeois state do not make it socialist because capitalists still remain in power. In contrast, the proletarian state destroys the exploitation of man by man and private ownership of the means of production, that is, the foundations of capitalism. Finally, another argument of the opponents of socialism is that socialism may be good in theory, but it can never be implemented in practice. They imply that there is no alternative to capitalism in the modern world, and that the construction of socialism is actually impractical and contrary to human nature. In fact, as we have already demonstrated, socialism is not just a dream of a better future, as the utopians imagined it, but a materialistic and scientific worldview that analyzes the conditions for the future development of society. Socialism is the logical development and overcoming of capitalism, just as capitalism itself has replaced feudal society. Only socialism can solve many problems of our time. Wars, crises, poverty, unemployment, and social inequality. The fact that socialism does not come by itself shows not its impracticability, but the persistent desire of the ruling classes to preserve outdated orders, in which units live at the expense of millions, in all possible ways, including world wars. As a result of a stubborn economic, political, and ideological struggle against the world socialist system, the capitalists achieved its defeat and the restoration of capitalism. Do socialist states exist today? Some states, such as China, Vietnam, or Cuba, have retained socialist symbols. However, they have little to do with socialism. There is inequality and exploitation in these countries. These states have become part of the world capitalist system. Their communist parties are corrupted by opportunism, and the bourgeoisie is in power. In future videos, we will highlight the specific situation in these countries. Historically, the first and largest state, deprived of human exploitation by man, and that which eliminated the market, private property, and the anarchy of production, was the Soviet Union. And although it was not possible to build complete communism in the last century, the experience of the USSR and other socialist countries tells us the main thing. Despite all the failures, History has proved that building socialism is possible, and it shows that it is still possible today. The theorists and practitioners of communism, such as Marx, Engels, Lenin, and Stalin, had a clear idea of scientific socialism and fought all their lives against opportunists and the enemies of the working class, who distorted the meaning of socialism. It was not the unification of various left-wing ideologies, but a single Marxist-Leninist theory that made it possible to create a clear concept of socialism and its successful construction. In our time, those who distort the theory of socialism actually serve the interests of the ruling class, which benefits from right and left deviant mistakes, as well as the general disorganization that pursues the modern workers and communist movement. Communists should learn from the experience of the socialist countries of the past, find their mistakes, and move forward to new class battles. By firmly adhering to the Marxist-Leninist theory, the working class will be able to free itself from capitalist wage slavery and put the ideas of socialism back into practice. Stay tuned.